Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or just welcome to my talk at Eagle Conference. My name is Jana Lütke, and I invite you to a roller coaster trip about emotional arcs and reader responses. What can you expect in the next few minutes? My talk is divided into two parts. In part one, I shortly introduce the four book study, an online study in which we collected rating data for about 12,000 sentences. In part two, I reported some of our data analysis, especially the analysis of the sentence valence ratings with a focus on temporal changes. We try to compute emotional arcs at book as well as at chapter level. Part one, the four book study. Four book study is part of, a Chilzer, of the Chilsa project, an interdisciplinary project about advanced sentiment analysis for the understanding of effective aesthetic responses to literary text. This project is led by Gerhard Lauer, Arthur Jacobs and myself, and within that project, colleagues from different disciplines, especially from the literary science, from digital humanities, as well as from psychology, worked together. We want to um, explore the relationship between emotions described in the text and our reader responses. We have several goals for the four book study. As we are interested in the reader responses, we try to measure that data at sentence, at chapter, as well as at book level. We want to use that data to compare reactions to children's and youth literature, focusing on the temporal dynamics. Um, that means one of the most important goals, especially for the today's talk, is the empirical validation of emotional arcs. There is also a long-term goal within the four-book study, that's the optimization of sentiment algorithms, especially for literary text. And when you're interested in that part, please listen to the talk of Simone Ribora, Marina Lehmann and Anne Holmann here at Eagle Conference. As described, the four book study is about emotional reactions of our reader. Each participant in that study read an entire book. That takes a lot of time. Normal reading time for our participants was between one to six weeks. The books we choose consist of several chapters and we use that chapters to create single reading sessions. In that reading sessions, always one chapter was read. The chapter was presented sentence by sentence. That means the first step was to divide each chapter into single sentences. That looks like that. We are now in the middle of a dialogue of one of the chosen books. And as an intended reader or listener, you might recognize that here uh, you find some lines with more than one sentences. That's why I choose exactly that example, because we decided very short sentences with only one or two words were attached to the sentence before or after, which reduce the workload for our participants. To give you a better impression of the task of the participants, let's have a look into the procedure for one single reading session. The session always starts with a mood questionnaire. Afterwards, we presented the text sentence by sentence. That means participants read the sentences and below each sentence two rating scales were depicted. They could indicate it whether the sentences triggered something more positive, something neutral or something more negative. That's the valence scale. Or on the other side, uh, we find the arousal scale. That means uh, participants could indicate whether the sentence triggered something more calming or something more exciting. They read the sentences, they rated valence and arousal, and that again and again until the end of the chapter. After reading the chapter, we presented again the valence and the arousal scale, but this time participants should indicate valence and arousal for the entire chapter. Afterwards, we presented again the mood questionnaire some comprehension questions and a questionnaire about their reading experiences. We uh, asked for transportation, emotional involvement and something like that. Then there was a possibility for a break and the reader could decide to go on after an hour or after a day. That creates a lot of data. At sentence level, we have valence and arousal rating. At chapter level, we also have valence and arousal rating, but also information about comprehension and the reading experience. And at book level, we again ask for valence and arousal. That means after reading the last chapter, participants have to indicate the valence and the arousal of the entire book. We also ask for familiarity, liking, and for the personality of the main characters. And moreover, there were some questions about the reader itself. Uh, we asked, for example, for some personality aspects and 
we asked questions about their reading behavior. Which books were used for the studies? We uh, identified two children's books and two youth books. The two children's books in total are shorter than the two youth books, but uh, within both groups, we identified one book uh, describing something in real world and another book describing a fictional world. Children's books entailed less chapters, less number of sentences and less number of words. We choose a book by Gudrun Mebs, a famous German author, as a children's book describing a real story. That's a story about a young boy and his grandma. We uh, use the book by John Green, The Fault in Our Stars, about a young, a young woman with censor, also as a real story. We uh, use the famous book by Michael Ende, Jim Button, Button and the and Lucas, the engine driver, as a fictional story, and the fictional story for uh, the young adults is one of the Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood films. Um, last words about the sample. Um, each book was read by 20 participants. Um, we identified or we used native German adults as participants because it's clear collecting Valence ratings at sentence, as chapter, as well as at book level is not possible for young children. Um, in total, we have four sub subgroups. Each group read one book. There were no gender and age differences between the subsamples. Most participants were in their early 20s. There were also no differences due to liking. As described, we asked for liking at the very end uh, of the study. You see here the results for the uh, two children's books depicted in blue and the results for the two youth books depicted in green. Um, on average, there are no differences. Also, we see a lot of inter-individual inter differences within the subsamples. We also asked uh, for the overall valence. And here we see not only inter-individual differences, but also differences between the books. Um, as expected, the two children's books uh, were rated as more positive than the two youth books, and the most negative book is the book by J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter book. Before I go on to the second part, I will end it with some more descriptions about our data, especially the data collected at sentence level, as described. Um, I get out of the four book study um, valence ratings for each sentences for, from 20 different persons. So the question was, does our or do our readers agree in their valence ratings? To test that, I calculated interrate availabilities for each chapters. That means I calculated the so-called interclass correlations. Here you find the results for all four books. And uh, when you focus especially on the average, you see this, that the mean ICC for all four books is above uh, 0.9, which indicated an excellent variability. I were also interested whether the reader variability is less than the text variability. To test that, I calculated mixed models with subjects and sentences nested at chapters as random effects to get out some data describing the amount of variance due to differences between subjects and due to differences between sentences and chapters. Um, I again calculated that separately for each of the four books. And as you see here in the data, in the data indicating the amount of variance, the variance due to subject variability is always smaller than the variance due to chapter variability or due to sentence variability, which is the uh, highest variance source here in our data. That means um, we decided to aggregate the data. That means to calculating the average valence value for each sentences. That is something also suggested by Beskin in 1994. Now we can go on to the second part of the today's talk. Collecting a lot of uh, valence rating at sentence level and create a lot of data, and I can plot that data as I have done here for the books of Gudrun Mebs, so that uh, we can see the temporal changes. Temporal changes mean uh, we plot on the x-axis the sentences starting from the first sentences in the first chapter over the second chapter, the third chapter, and so on until the end of the book. 
we see here on the y-axis the valence ratings, the average valence over all participants reading that book, and we see there are parts in the book triggering more negative um, reactions, and there might be other parts, like here, triggering more positive reaction. There are a lot of changes over time, and changes over time within a book, especially due to the emotions, are often described with the help of emotional arcs. But uh, in the most studies, emotional arcs are calculated based on so-called sentiment analysis. That means authors looked into the text, tried to identify text passages describing something more positive or something more negative. That also creates a lot of data. They applied different smoothing algorithms to identify some major trends and to reduce uh, the so-called random variations. Wagen et al., for example, have done that for over thousand books, and um, doing so, they identified six basic shapes describing the main changes due to uh, the emotions in the text. Uh, here you get an impression, and I assume that most of us are familiar with that emotional arcs. We see patterns, for example, where the story starts uh, with something negative, but then it gets more positive and till the end, which has a positive outcome, or there's maybe more ups and downs, starting with something negative, a uh, story develops into a positive direction, then something negative happened, and at the end we have something positive, a pattern or a shape called Cinderella. Wagen et al. interpreted their results as proof for Fort Court and Vonnegut's thesis that all stories have that simple forms. But they also described that uh, there might be texts with some more um, complex forms, and more complex forms were described by Archer and Jokers, for example. They also studied books, but different books compared to Wagon. They used different sentiment algorithm tools, and they also used different smoothing algorithms. And at the end, they suggested seven plot lines characterized by a so called three act structure. Having a look on that uh, plot lines, we see that there are uh, some plots relatively similar to the shapes described by Reagan, like here, comedy and tragedy, but there are also some uh, different shapes, like here, uh, shape F or even shape E. Altogether, that shapes are the results of approaches deployed on the level of the text. And there is the question, and that is the main question for the today's talk, are we able to identify similar shapes when we analyze reader reaction? That means when we analyzed uh, not the result of a textual analysis, but when we analyzed uh, human ratings. The first question we should ask is, can we transfer the approaches for analyzing sentiments, that means analyzing text, to the analysis of reader responses? From a statistical point of view, that answer is easy. Yes, of course we can. We can apply smoothing, for example, the discrete Gaussian transformation as suggested by Jokers, to identify simpler shapes also in human ratings. Let's look at, on a simple example that are toy data. Imagine we have a short text with 20 sentences. We collect the valence ratings for each of the sentences. That may give us a pattern like that. And without any statistics, without any smoothing algorithms, you might be able to identify a more general trend. And that more general trend is uh, like the Cinderella pattern described by Ragged. Uh, discrete Gaussian transformation make it possible uh, to plot that simpler shape with the help of one smoothed curve. I applied the discrete Gaussian transformation to that data, and I get out this beautiful red smoothed curve. When I look on our data collected in the four book study, uh, there is a lot of uh, more information and I assume a lot of more random noise. Yes, I can apply discrete Gaussian transformation to get out a simpler shape like that uh, red line, but the question is how meaningful are this, these shapes or arcs? The data of the four book study allows us to test um, that question. Why? As described, we collected not only valence rating at the level of sentences, we also collected valence ratings at the level of chapters. And uh, when I plot the valence ratings collected at chapter level, I also get um, a curve 
describing some temporal changes. And the main question is, when I use a smoothing algorithm to identify the major trends here at sentence level, is one output similar to the temporal changes observed here at chapter level? That's something I want uh, to do in the first step. Let's start with a closer look on the chapter ratings and the temporal changes visible here. I plotted the chapter ratings for all four books. Again, the two children's books are plotted in blue, the two youth books are plotted in green. The pattern we can see here are much more complex than the pattern described by Regan, Archer and Jokos. We also see some differences between the books. Um, there are several differences. For example, um, when we have a closer look to the MAPES, the data of Gudrun MAPES, we also see that the chapters have more or less the same length, but they vary due to the valence. When we look on the green book, we see that the chapters have different lengths. Um, we have very, very short uh, chapters and longer chapters, but we have also differences in valence ratings. And also here, our very short uh, chapters differ relatively strong due to the indicated level of valence. What happens when I use the smoothing algorithm? Uh, no, when I apply a smoothing algorithm to the data collected at sentence level, is there a way to get out that kind of pattern visible here on the level of chapter ratings? When I apply discrete Gaussian transformation with a strong amount of smoothing, that means with a small parameter k, I get out simple shapes, but that simple shapes have only small similarities, which the temporal changes observable in chapter ratings. When I decrease the amount of smoothing, that means when I increase the number for the parameter key, I get out uh, curves which are much more similar to that uh, pattern we observed at chapter ratings. Please focus again here um, to the books, uh, to the uh, graph depicting the data for the MAPES book. In lighter blue, again, we see the pattern for the chapter ratings. In dark blue, we see the pattern the smooth sentence rating, and there is a high level of similarity. So are the smoothed curves meaningful? My answer is yes, they are meaningful because we are able to reproduce similar changes over time as visible in chapter ratings. Again, here you see um, the results for the MAPES book, um, but have a look on the results for the green book. Uh, here the similarity between the temporal pattern observed in our chapters and the smooth curve uh, based on sentence rating is not as high. But when I further decrease the amount of smoothing, I get a curve which is much more similar. So similarity between the smooth curve and the pattern observed in the chapter ratings depends on the amount of smoothing. And I assume that uh, different patterns um, therefore are important for the optimal level of smoothing that are text lengths, but maybe also information density because we get a good match here where a high information density is, but uh, we get a not as good fit when the information density is not as high. The last question for today is, can we also identify different shapes as described by Regan or Archer and Jokers? That's a question we cannot ask at book level because we studied only four books, but when we go on the level of the chapter, we might be able to search for different general patterns. At chapter level, we have around 100 chapter and we can also calculate the emotional arcs for each individual chapter. Um, there's one problem we um, have to solve. Um, our chapters have different lengths, but using discrete Gaussian transformation as a smoothing algorithm, algorithm allows us to rescaling um, and to rescaling the data so that all emotional arcs computed at chapter level have the same length, and that rescaling has no influence uh, to the overall pattern of each emotional arcs. The result, uh, that means emotional arcs at chapter level, for example here for the MAPES book, and the rescaling of uh, the lengths looks like that. As you may see, uh, we see differences between the chapters, but the main question again is when we do that for all chapters and all books, 
are we able to identify some basic um, shapes or forms? Um, we try to answer that question by using a hierarchical cluster analysis. We conducted a so-called shape-based analysis because we are interested in basic shapes. That means in the first step we have to calculate the similarity between single shapes. We do that with, the, with an algorithm called the dynamic time warping. Um, and when we calculated a hierarchical cluster analysis, we get out something like a dendrogram that makes visible what such a cluster analysis do. The cluster analysis try to group um, chapter with similar emotional arcs into groups. It starts to identify very small groups with only two chapters and then it calculated again the similarities to identify bigger groups. The main question is always where is the best cut off? So it's the best cluster solution, a solution with only two big clusters or maybe with some more clusters. To answer that question, uh, we calculated cluster validity indices and they um, indicated that the best cluster solution, the best cast, uh, cut off is a solution with six clusters. Let's have a look on the cluster itself. Each cluster could be described by a prototypical shape when we look on that shapes for cluster one, two, and three, we see that all three clusters are characterized by a pattern where the ending is much more positive than the beginning. In contrast, cluster four, five, and six are characterized by a pattern where the ending is not really positive. It is strongly negative in five and six, and in four, it is slightly more negative than the beginning. We also see that we have uh, big clusters like cluster one and cluster four containing more than 30 chapters. We also have small clusters like cluster three, cluster five, and cluster six to that clusters on uh, less than 10 chapters belong to them. And we have an intermediate cluster like cluster two, which um, is identified based on the similarity for 50 chapters. So we can look from which books are the chapters belonging to one cluster come. Um, for the more positive um, clusters, we see that uh, most that the single chapters belonging to that clusters coming from all four books. There's only one expectation. The second cluster was uh, strongly positive trend from the beginning to the end. That pattern is not visible in the Harry Potter book. In contrast, when we look to the uh, more negative patterns in the cluster four to six, we see that that pattern is visible not in the books by Gudrun Mebs, but in the books uh, of Michael Ende, Green and Rowling. Again, we can ask the question whether the prototypical shapes make sense. And again, we can use the valence ratings at chapter level to answer that question. That means I can calculate for um, each cluster, the average valence rating is collected at chapter level. That means I take all chapter belonging to cluster one and calculate the average valence rating uh, at chapter level. Let's have a look on cluster two. That was a cluster with a strongly positive trend with cluster six, where we have a strongly negative trend. And yes, uh, we find significant differences. The Valence rating at chapter level indicated that all chapters belonging to cluster two were rated as more positive than the chapters belonging to cluster six. That means um, in total, it seems to be that valence ratings at chapter corresponds with the shapes or with the prototypical shapes characterizing each single cluster. We have um, on average lower valence, valence values for clusters with negative intrusion or ending that means for the cluster four to six compared to the clusters with a positive ending, the cluster one to CB. So let's summarize. I presented you the four book study in which we collected valence ratings at sentence level. We used a smoothing algorithm like discrete Cosine transformation to calculate the emotional arcs at book level. And we try to validate that arcs 
uh, we compare the pattern um, visible in that smoothed curves with the pattern visible in chapter weightings and the smooth sentence weightings will produce similar shapes as visible in chapter weightings. But the amount of similarity depends from the amount of smoothing and it seems to be that the optimal level of smoothing depends not only from the research question but also from text and length, from text length and something like information density. I also calculated emotional arcs at chapter level to look for some prototypical shapes. Uh, we were able to identify six basic shapes and we, ha and we have a closer look to that six basic shapes or prototypical shapes and when we compare that shapes with shapes described um, based on text analysis we see a lot of similarities. For example, we can also identify a pattern uh, Wagon et al. described as rag to riches, we can also see something, something like men in the hole. And um, as Archa and Joppers described, our prototypical shapes are best understood when we compare the beginning and the ending and we, we have a look what happens in the middle. But the result of our cluster analysis is not, shape, uh, is not stable. When I choose different parameters, for example, using another way to calculate the similarity between emotional arcs or using another smoothing algorithm to calculate the emotional arcs, then the output of the cluster analysis changes. Maybe the optimal cluster solution is sometimes four and sometimes nine. So um, taken together, the number and also the shape of prototypical um, emotional arcs depends from the chosen parameters for the statistics. That means uh, before we can say that are really the prototypical pattern describing reader reactions, we need more data and perhaps we also need another way to handle our data. I presented you an, an, an analysis based on average valence weightings, but um, the next try is to analyze the weightings of each participants individually and independent, but that is then a story for another talk. Thank you for your attention and I hope we meet us in Monopoly so that I'm able to answer questions you may have.